Hello, I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, with our host, the Rev. Joseph Hinchy and Lisa Fertini Campbell. Now here's Lisa. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome everyone to the very last episode in the Directed Retreat Dukan Altum. I'm Lisa Fortini Campbell, and I'm here with the Reverend Joseph Henchi of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. So welcome one last time, Father. And welcome to you too, Lisa. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Hallelujah. Well, it's hard to believe. We will shortly have done 52 reflections mm-hmm. on the spirituality of St. Peter taking us far out into the deep of our Catholic faith and have learned so much over the course of this directed retreat. And so now you're going to finish us off with a bang, aren't you, Father, to the, well, the third of uh, your three reflections on prayer. Well, it's always a hope. Like Luke says in chapter 2, the Lord saved the best wine until the end. I wish that were true, but probably this is like glory to the Father and to the Son, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end, amen. amen. And you left the Holy Spirit out of that Hallelujah. one. You can't do that. So, um, as I say, last episodes, we have been looking at prayer and its meaning in our life, um, how to how to think about prayer, how to be spontaneous, but still have some structure mm-hmm. to our prayer life. And it is a beautiful way to, mm-hmm. to end something mm-hmm. that has taken us into such thoughtful mm-hmm. reflections on topics like the transfiguration and the agony of the garden and that sense of, of self-giving that, mm-hmm. that um, we all try to be as good Catholic mm-hmm. people. And, of course, with Peter as our model, the mm-hmm. man who was a man like us and tried, failed, tried again, failed again, tried again, and just trusted in the mercy mm-hmm. of God. That's how he ended. His final end was to trust in God's mercy, being transfigured, it seems, by his understanding of the transfiguration in Second Peter. So, Father, what will be the focus of this very last <clears throat> reflection? Well, from the perspective of divine revelation, the world may be divided into epochs, eras, or times, or into populations. And it seems it boils down to three non-believers, Israelites, and Christians. So each of these categories are recorded as having sought something greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. So we'll look in on that as a fitting end to the Transfiguration as our guideline and guidepost, our traffic signal on the highway to heaven. Well, and I think it's such an appropriate way to end because these... These are times where there are fewer believers mm-hmm. than than any of us would like. Um, and, and of course, that was true in Christ's time. Mm-hmm. He, he walked into a largely pagan mm-hmm. world, mm-hmm. a very small Jewish community in the grand scheme of things, and out of that flourished the most beautiful Christian church. So I think there's a message of hope mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. gained from this, as well as some ideas about how we can continue traveling our quest for God, Mm -hmm. and perhaps foster others as well. This is true, and it's interesting in this age of stargazing that it's repeated often that there are many, as many planets in the skies as there are grains of sand on our beaches. When you think of it for a million, there are trillions of galaxies, and each galaxy probably holds a trillion stars. So they say there are 23 sextrillion stars with 23 zeros after the numbers. My goodness, it's impossible to imagine. It is. So in this little world in which you look out at the Milky Way and see that the Earth is just a speck there and the great mystery, how come there's intelligence or life here that we've ever recognized or ever been able to contact. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, a a marvelous, mysterious thought to begin Mm -hmm. us, and perhaps you'll follow that up with a prayer. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our <clears throat> daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. And St. Peter, please pray for us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, Father, where would you like to start? All right, we'll start with the non-believers. All right. Uh, how I, we look at books we've mentioned a few times, like Joseph Campbell and the Many Faces of God, and how across the early centuries, relatively early centuries as far as human life is concerned, there was always a quest. Why does this happen? And looking out at the stars or the phenomena. Can you imagine in primitive times an eclipse mm, yes. without any realization what had happened or is this the end or some of those shooting meteors that have or, or showers of stars or whatever the phenomena is. But anyway, the non-believing world, if that's what we could call them, uh, we, we read about them in Acts 17. And the Lord did all this so that all the nations might seek the deity and by feeling their way towards him, find him. Uh So the image seems to be in a modern mind, there's a very dark hallway leading from the vestibule to the main body and we are feeling our way along the wall to find the switch. Mm -hmm. And, And this quest for the Lord that is found everywhere as we see as one of the Guys, we are feeling along the wall as they have for centuries. So the word in everyday Greek, the quest, means that that which ordinary human beings do in their daily existence, uh, it's sometimes it's a studied research or some it's just a glance or a, a mental wondering. What, what is that? What causes that? It is also a technical term that implies an authentic philosophical study, deep research, or as we would say in the New Testament world, an exercise of the gift of wisdom, trying to judge things by their ultimate causes. Well, Luke tells us in Acts 14, In the past, the Lord allowed every nation to go its own way. But even then, he did not leave you without evidence of himself in the good things he does for you. He sends you rain from heaven. He makes your crops grow when they should. And he gives food and makes you happy. So all of these worlds divide the quest from God, from nature, looking out at the sky and praising its maker, or history. Look at the extraordinary good people who preceded us. And you find that in a number like Hebrews 11, the cloud of witnesses. You find it in the latter chapters of, of Sirach, the, the meditation on the great, the hall of fame of early Israel. Well, apparently this is the way it has always been. At least this is the way the biblical writers see it. So pondering over this reality, the non-believer in many instances came to discover and to contemplate actually the one who made the world, who was the savior, the one who governs human beings, was fixed on all humanity, their limitations. That's Deuteronomy 32. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided the sons of men, he fixed their bounds according to their number. Mm. That was the first way of trying to understand, or an early way. And when they came to discover the one who establishes life, breath, and all things, the one from whom humanity receives everything, who is always near, they began to wander further. Yes, It's yes. like building blocks, or these blocks, or these great geniuses who prepare the skyscrapers. They say that uh, sometimes about great theologians, they would have been architects had they not been uh, theologians. And all of this, <clears throat> um, traveling on a road of wonderment and curiosity, mm-hmm. in uh, one of the reflections a few times ago, you said that that wonderment is so natural 
to mm-hmm. us as human beings, and we've mm-hmm. all had had children in our lives mm-hmm. who constantly pester us with, what is that, what is that, what is that, what is that? And that is their, that's their natural mm-hmm. curiosity, which I suppose can be irritating, but really is the most hopeful thing. It is. And you know, being an old man in second childhood, <laughs> we do the same thing. What is that? What is it? Where are we going? Where have I been? <laughs> Where are my keys? <laughs> <laughs> Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Anyway, so... A number of non-believers reach this, reach the goal in their quest. For example, the centurion of the gospel. This man loved the people of Israel, and he built a synagogue for them, as we read in Luke seven. This man is destined for eternal life, as we see in Acts thirteen. Just like this centurion, Cornelius is one who prayed to God, and his prayer was heard. Mm-hmm. At Acts ten. These people coming at these last times announced by the prophets are the non-Jews who set themselves to the task of sincerely seeking the Lord. This passage passage is taken from James' speech predicting future times by quoting a passage from Amos. This is found in Acts 15. After that, I shall return and rebuild the fallen house of David. And I shall rebuild it from its ruins, and I will restore it. Then the rest of mankind, all the pagans who are consecrated to my name, will look to the Lord, says the Lord, who had made this known a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is always fascinated by those people who were not of the chosen race, but who believed. We find that, as we've mentioned a few times, in Judith when there was a captain in Holly Fernie's army. And Holly Fernie says, who is that people up on the hills resisting us? And the, and the soldier responded with this beautiful soliloquy of a faith in, uh, interpretation of the Israelites, which angered his general, Holly Fernie's. He says, you go up into that hill, and tomorrow we will destroy you with them. Mm. <laughs> and he did. But the next day, Holy Furnace lost his own head. Mm. So, uh, Cyrus. Cyrus is a good example. It's amazing. He's called servant of God because mm-hmm. he allowed the Israelites to return home. And as we said, the centurion on, on Calvary. That's right. Truly, this was the son of God. Well, and, anyway. And then, oh, and, and of course, we can't forget who is the, who is the leader who was bathed and healed from yes, his Yes, the Syrian. Syrian general. Yes, the Syrian general. And the general. handmaid of the household said, go jump in our lakes yeah. and you'll be better. He said, we have lakes in, yes. in in Syria. I'm going home. He said, it's so simple. Just do it. So he did and was cured of his leprosy. Uh, Naaman, the Syrian general. That's right. That's right. So they're, those are wonderful stories. Yeah, they're wonderful stories and they do ent- have entertained people and inspired them and encouraged them and so on. Luke even considers that the quest of non-believers is of such a quality that in some cases these people might be better disposed than the chosen ones following the centurion. The non-believers of Antioch came to, in for praise. The pagans thanked the Lord for his message in Acts 13. Christ himself would say that the prostitutes and others would reach the kingdom before the self-righteous. So the salvation of God has been sent to the pagans, or as Peter put it in a very meaningful address in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. That's right. So the salvation of non-believers, there's this recent modern dialogue, how many are saved? The majority of human beings or the minority? Well, the arguments go both ways, but I has not seen or heard. We don't know, and maybe it's a useless, a useless discussion. From the scriptures, we simply don't know. However, in scripture, we have the universal salvific will of God. God wants everyone to be saved, but he's left it up to each one of us. Or that idea that Christ's precious blood flowed out in total abundance and covers the entire world. A drop of that blood, as we know, the chill of of Christmas Eve 
when Christ was born would have sufficed to redeem the whole world because it was it is a theandric act, meaning human and divine connectedly. So Luke considers anyone well disposed to hear the word of God. They come eventually to seek the gospel, and thus we find the proconsul Sergius Paulus described as extremely intelligent, and he asked to hear the word of God, Acts chapter thirteen. So it's Saint Thomas's old idea. Whoever does what he or she can, God does not deny the grace. And the little flower became a great forerunner of Vatican II when we used to anguish over babies born without baptism. And where, where did they go? And those of us in the trenches, I was in a parish at the time, and this happened twice in the parish to different families. And to try to go and to explain, <clears throat> well, the child can't go to heaven but it won't mm-hmm. go to hell, and, and it, well, you go, well, you go to limbo. Right. There's no limbo in Scripture. So Second Vatican Council quotes St. Teresa, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, at least implicitly, in ways known but to God, these little ones, let the little ones come unto me. Mm-hmm. He doesn't need sacraments. We do. Right. So right. anyway, so that's the first vague opening you might think of. Just think of the great discoveries of the early Egyptians in astronomy and these extraordinary scholars through the years that have developed astronomy to what it is now. I don't know, I can only have compassion for a young student of astronomy. There is so much information in the last 10, 20 years from the Hubble spacecraft (laughs) or the Hubble telescope. It'll take generations to... Uh, to uh, adjust, uh, to accept, and uh, to uh, study. <clears throat> so, anyway, that's the non-believing world. And then we come to the world of Israel. For some reason, God chose this unruly, stubborn people as his very own. In fact, he calls it his special treasure. Mm. Well, <clears throat> what that means is the king had a lot of resources, a lot of bank accounts, Well, tucked in there somewhere was a little area that we used to have when I was provincial of my community for extraordinary needs that you wanted to keep quiet and so on. And we had a, the the amount we had in there was governed, but the use of it was up to the good sense of the provincial and often his council. But anyway, it's that special account that would take care of extraordinary needs. Well, God refers Israel with this word. When David gave the first down payment for the for the temple that would eventually be built by his son Solomon, he took it from his special treasure. Well, when we think of the salvation of the world, God took this nondescript person as he takes you and me and all of us, nondescript as we may be or whatever importance we may have, he takes us and I've often, kiddingly, used to tell the sisters on retreats, I felt I was in the company of the donkey on Palm Sunday, that God can use a donkey to bring his word to town. So the Israelites then began seeking the Lord. Some outstanding leaders appeared. So Paul characterized the religion of the Jews by the very same term that Luke used. Now that's understandable because Luke and Paul were connected. The groping search of non-believers for the truth. Paul speaks thus, It is not Israel as a whole that found what it was seeking, but only the chosen few, and that's the remnant. God always protects a remnant. I think often of Pope Benedict, how he said the Catholic Church of the future will be a very much smaller entity to try to get people to follow it totally with un, no restrictions in moral or dogma. They'll follow the word of God in its totality. So we look at now at the Psalms. There are beautiful studies called the Creation Psalms. The Old Testament shows that the people of Israel experienced a very long and arduous journey resembling the quest of the Gentile nations in their quest for God. And we still use the Exodus, 
this ambitious migration, this heroic journey, as the description of a Christian vocation. Right. Whatever limitations we have, we've been called to go beyond the stars. So the Psalter contains a number of texts which review this cosmic inspiration of the Hebrews. It is in looking out at the world, pondering over it in all of its immense amplitude, that Israel became to discover, came to discover God. Mm-hmm. So there's a combination of really doing the best part we can, the best thing we can on our part, and God's grace. It's a pretty good idea of modern meditation. Right. This daily prayer that we try to give to thinking, pondering, attentively as best we can for as long as we can. Most priests that I know and religious nuns believe in a holy hour uh, every day. While they'll often tell you that most of the time they're distracted. Well, I'll never forget the old Italian confrere of mine who told us, Joseph, if you are making a holy hour and you are distracted for 59 minutes, make that last minute the best one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it seems to me a application, an application of St. Thomas's. this is the best possible time because at this moment God can do his best in us and for us. However, <clears throat> one author tries to show that the religious thought of Israel is, is correct when it does not accept the cosmic religion of its time. For example, the belief was the sun and moon were married. Right. And the stars were their children. Mm-hmm. Well, now somebody bent the sliver of the moon so that Mary could stand on it, the crescent moon, and she has the stars as her raiment. But in those days, they were divinized some, almost. So the Israelites were most capable of integrating within their own quest a wisdom search which came to them from the outside. St. Paul stated that the Greeks had sought wisdom a kind of groping quest. One, however, that was not without dedication, Israel's search and discovery of God took a variety of forms. And this yearning or searching for the meaning of life, the meaning of the creation, that's why many modern theologians look at beauty, the extraordinary beauty. I've always been fascinated by wonderful history, the extraordinary people who have preceded us, their discoveries and their efforts to understand the treasures of the universe. Well, Israel, of course, was extraordinary in seeking knowledge, seeking understanding. We find that in Proverbs Proverbs 2, 15, 18, Daniel 8. There's a quest for wisdom in Proverbs 14. This expression is susceptible to a variety of nuances. Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes 7.25 seeks wisdom but this is not the same as Sirach 23 wisdom or the religious understanding seems to have increased over that period of time so <clears throat> Sirach chapter 1 tells you that's a beautiful book to study and to read and to meditate on it's very very thought provoking all wisdom is from the Lord and it is his forever. Before all things were created, showed an understanding is everlasting. For whom has the root of wisdom been uncovered? Her resource of ways, who knows them? He himself created her, looking upon her, and assessed her, and poured her out on all his works to be with all mankind as his gift, and he conveyed her to all those who love him. You know, in our own day and age, I, like with many others, have been fascinated by astronomy and the extraordinary wonders uncovered in our lifetime. But there's also, did you ever see a close-up of a butterfly or a oh, close-up sure. of a leaf? It's extraordinary, or the close-up diagram of a human eye. <laughs> or those who are suffering lumbago, how many bones are there in the foot, mm-hmm. the knee, the shoulder? or the neck mm. that we turn and suffer from, from our pinched nerves. Von Rad, the great Lutheran theologian the theology of the Old Testament, has noted that in these verses it is a question of the wisdom 
which is with God. Without knowing it, they were seeking God. Without real, because God had was a thought they had not had. But they kept looking out and going further and further. Are the great geniuses of Egypt, the uh, diagrams and triangles. Oh, sure. and good Lord, it's the fact it was so great. In the early years, we used to try to just present the theology of the Trinity with triangles. Mm-hmm. Today, with the great German Lutheran theologian Jürgen Moltmann said, look at Good Friday. What does God mean when he says God is love? Just yes. look at Good Friday. Look at That's Good what Friday. it means. Well, I think one of the things mm. that you're, you're saying here, too, is that, is that there is this questing that is mm. going on and on. Mm. And, and the more that we can stay open to that, the more that we can keep going, Mm. the greater the gift of wisdom God will give us. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the dangers of our time is that we lose our wonderment. Mm. We lose Mm. our curiosity and we lose our openness even to other Mm. people and Mm. their ideas. A friend of mine who is an industrial engineer, he's not a religious man, Mm. but he says the attitude of wisdom is to have confidence in what you know Mm. so that you can move forward. Mm. But a constant openness to what might be, because constant openness and never knowing anything would have you sitting in your house Mm. afraid to go out all day Mm. long, but having too much confidence Mm. so that you lose that flavor of Mm. wonderment and curiosity leads to people who are very static and inbred and small-minded, and and that's God doesn't want that for us. In the many models of redemption, one of them is sports. Athletics, like Paul in the long distance run, he's getting tired. Or the boxer who's worn out and the, and the fight isn't over yet. Or the great example that seems based, at least according to some interpreters, on the sacred games, the, the image of Christ in Gethsemane. And all of these people, these sports, need physical exercise. So it's very sad for a teacher, let's say, of philosophy who finds a promising student who never studies, or a teacher of music, Mm -hmm. somebody who never practices. Practices. So we need spiritual exercises, we need philosophical exercises, and that's why we need theological meditation. If we endure in that, persevere in that, keep, no matter how many failures, keep trying, someday it becomes, by God's grace and gift, contemplation. And contemplation is used twice in the Vatican Council, referring to the whole church, De Verbum 8 and Sacrosanto, no, yeah, Sacrosanto Concilium on liturgy. Uh, and the, the church is first contemplative and then active. So what happens in Sirach 1, in verse 4, the notion shifts and the author begins to say, it's this wisdom that created the world. There's such an order, thinking of uh, Pope Clement, Jewish Pope, yes. looking out over the city of Rome in the night and praising the maker of the stars and wishing that the order of the outer space would have played also in the in the church. But however, the beloved old Pope never knew about the black hole <laughs> <laughs> that is sucking in all kinds of residue. But anyway, the idea is that the sky looks placid. Yes, you look yes. out in the night and it's a, It's a very consoling image. So once God was discovered or revealed or understood, then the next step is the need to be like him, Mm -hmm. the need to have reasonable discourse, reasonable marriages, reasonable legislation, order in the universe, and so on, some kind of similarity with God and his order and his conduct as we often say facetiously in our own time, everybody has rights, Mm -hmm. but nobody seems to have many duties except the the lowest of the low. Well, and I think that in pagan times, the Greek and Roman gods, the idea wasn't so much to want to be like them. They were a pretty uh, Mm. disreputable lot, Mm. most of them, but to stay on their good side. Mm. And so sacrifice was something that was kind of like bribery. You... Mm gave them things mm-hmm. in the hopes they would give you good things mm-hmm. back when they were in a good mood. Mm-hmm. But our Christian faith, I think, calls us 
to make mm. our sacrifice, us, mm. as you say so many mm. times, make of your lives mm. a living oblation to mm. the mercy of mm. God. So it's a very different understanding mm. of the relationship of God and yeah. man, which is mm. just a, it's a wonderful thing. This whole concept of sacrifice comes hard and lives hard because it, it's not a popular image, but I think any one of us might remember a mother, <laughs> what they do, the sacrifice they make auto- automatically, which gives many people a pause, uh, uh, a pause to reflect this deep goodness in people living in the same world we are, but totally giving of themselves. So therefore, the quest for God in the universe then led to the quest of God in history. Mm-hmm. Just look at this cloud of witness, this group, this heroic group, groping among non-believers. The word quest really comes from the liturgy, which was stimulated by the proclamations of the prophets. And there's something very special about it in the discourse of St. Paul in Athens. He said <clears throat> in Acts 17, God overlooked that sort of thing when men were ignorant. But now he's telling everyone, everywhere, they must repent because he has fixed a day when the whole world will be judged in righteousness. So these references to Psalms, now this is the hour, the time, this fixed day, these are the last times, all of these become as we read in Deuteronomy, tell your son or your second new generation why we celebrate this night so that the traditions would be carried on. And one of the theories for the Book of Wisdom, maybe the last Old Testament book, was that some Jewish families were sending their precious sons and daughters to Alexandria in Egypt for an education. And they hoped that they would not lose their faith, and which is a worry for our own families today. It, hopefully it still is a worry, because very often this is what happens. Even so many people who become converted say, well, my first years in college was a total break away from home, from faith, religion, and its practice. And then I came to realize that's not the way to go. Anyway, as we see in Psalm 77, whenever I am in trouble... I seek the Lord all night long. I stretch out my hands. My soul has no consolation. I thought of God and I sighed. I pondered and my soul failed me. Has God forgotten me? No. (laughs) It's a real beautiful little uh, insight. And these are like flashes of brilliance that go across the night sky. Well, then from contemplating nature and contemplating history... The next development was the quest for God in the temple. They began to create miniatures of the universe in which we lived. They had the greater lights and the lesser lights. They had fire and smoke and the reading of God's word, drums imitating the thunder and so on, and some kind of trumpets, I guess, too, and the the lyres, whatever those things were. So... uh, to go into the sanctuary in so many texts or to see the face of God or to look for God means to go into the sanctuary. That's mm-hmm. what it means. You you look for God or whenever you go into the sanctuary, that's what you're doing. And that's why we have the simple little ritual. When you went to a church, you bless yourself with holy water, this little sacramental, which is a way of throwing a kiss, I guess, at the Lord or some simple little gesture Say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. So this insight comes from um, maybe Zechariah 8.21, reflected in Acts 8.21, unless I have a mistake when the quotes come. Let us go and beg the favor of God to seek and to find him. I am now going myself. Mm -hmm. So that's more or less what what, what, what we do. So once you get into the temple. What do you say? What do you do? Ask questions. Mm-hmm. Who are you? What am I doing here? What's it all about, Alfie? Those songs and, and quests for the unknown world in which we live. So one eventually discovers a bond that scripture establishes between prayer and listening. 
there's a kind of a development. So to pray meant to speak to or with the Lord. Pray also means to pray and listen to the Lord. We used to say that when you read the scriptures, we listen to God speaking and we pray in our littleness. We try to speak with him. One of the great risks of theologians, as all of us know, who ever taught or had the privilege to teach this, to spend so much time thinking, speaking about God, and so little time speaking to God. Yes, I would think there would be a, a it would be a great temptation mm. at some point. Mm. Then you wonder if mm. uh, how much you lose sure. in the pursuit of that very sure. precious mm. service. Mm. Well, it's a risk. It, mm-hmm. It's heady stuff, and they always told us a little bit of knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. And most of us remember that facetious saying: <clears throat> "Prayer without study gets funny." But study without prayer gets funny. No, so <laughs> <laughs> I think you mean that 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 prayer without study you can become a, a little bit uh, crazy inside your yeah, own mind. Unusual development. Yeah, uh, crazy things develop. Yeah. But but study without prayer becomes very dry yeah. and inward looking in a different way and self inflating. Self inflating. The danger is, is really pride. So in the midst of all their festivals, they had a Yom Kippur, sometimes called the Old Testament uh, Good Friday. And the Lord, how many times do we read this? Why do you fast? It's not this kind of fasting that pleases me, but break unjust chains, undo the thongs of the yoke, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke, clothe those who are naked. That's the uh, (coughs) fasting. I would like to see. So, naturally, the next development was to seek the Lord in His Word. Yes. And that is a real graduation. We're going from maybe the apprentice to the journeyman to the specialist. And the council asks us priests and religious try to be specialists in prayer. But name of that, God, non habit. No one can give what he does not have. So it is a strong ministry among certainly the most important for a priest is to try to teach people how to make of their lives an oblation in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So every mystery is the sanctuary of God. I often think with many interpreters, the book of Psalms is like this gigantic cathedral. Psalm 1 is the vestibule. Then all the way down both sides are these individual Psalms, 149 more of them. And every one of them has a special canticle, petition, or attitude, or faith to offer praise to the Lord. So liturgy becomes a listening to God's word. We still have that, the listening to the word of God, not only with the ears, but with the heart. In order to grasp God's word, we we have to listen to it. We have to pay attention to it. How many times our mothers, now listen to me, pay attention Mm -hmm. to what I've done. I remember way, way back in the Wyman School in my hometown of Woburn, Massachusetts. The teacher would present once in a while as we moved along fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Now put on your thinking caps. That's right. I remember that, too. They <laughs> so, were still doing that 25 uh, years later so in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. We can still do that as people people searching the Lord. So Psalm 77 shows this in a wonderful way. Remember the Lord's achievements. Remember your marvels in the past. I reflect on all you did, O oh Lord. I ponder on all, on all your achievements. So that's why we find in Deuteronomy, which was a massive reform, often compared to Vatican II. Vatican II did not eliminate Vatican I or the Council of Trent. It tried to apply them to this day. Deuteronomy is the second norm. The first norm was Exodus. And as we've seen before, Anyone carefully reading the Ten Commandments in Exodus and the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, there's a huge development, centuries of development, some people would say, of distance between these two books and how often we are invited to ponder the Magnalia Dei, the wonders of God in the past. Just look what the Lord has done for you. And I think many of us have known 
as life uh, unfolds and we're coming down the home stretch, I got to say, in all honesty, in my own life, priesthood was better than I ever thought it could be, mm-hmm. as was my statement in life. I uh, thought of the priesthood as Italian wine that gets better with time. That's right. I think that's a, a fairly good, uh, a fairly good summation. So, <clears throat> what's the next step? The next step is the quest for God in signs and not in Jesus. That was not a development. This is a sinful generation. It prefers signs. The only sign the generation is going to have is the sign of Jonah in the belly of the whale. I often think of that great old Cardinal Fallhaber of Munich, who was dead, I don't know, I think he died in 1951, Cardinal Michael Fallhaber. And he was so afraid of the insatiable desire for the Western world, for the extraordinary in religion, like visions or signs, even of the evil one. And that can run amok when people are not guided by the prudence and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. As we read in 1 Corinthians, the Jews demand miracles, the Greeks look for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we uh, are caught up in this. The true wisdom is to see the hand of God in all things or to try to find the will of God in all things. So what is naturally the end of all this searching? The end is to seek and to find God in Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So the prayer of the followers of Jesus is one of lifelong searching, giving disciples counselors in the manner in which they ought to pray. Jesus joins the invitation of asking with the certitude of receiving, also of seeking, coupled with the conviction of finding, as we've seen in the Old Testament, Luke 11. So I say to you, knock, and it will be given to you. Search, you will find it. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. In fact, in Revelation, we say, knock, and the Lord will come in and have supper with us. A very welcome guest who comes to us. Well, and that makes me think back at, you know, the overall theme for these these many reflections uh, of St. Peter, uh, how how blessed he was to have that revelation when Christ asked him, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the mm-hmm. son of the living God. Mm-hmm. And he, he knew it. Mm-hmm. And, and it. And for a lot of the rest of us, it takes a long time to mm-hmm. find the truth mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting thing to another personal experience if they're not boring. On the trip to Italy when I was 22 years old, one night on the back of the boat, and I was struggling with the nostalgia of the shore <laughs> that I knew so well, the loved ones that left behind. But little by little, I began to think of what I'd find on the other end. <clears throat> I had a, a previous love of Rome. I don't know where it came from, but uh, maybe being brought up in an Italian Paris. I don't know. But all my life, I had that great uh, yearning for that. So in one way, when we see the lights dimming in one direction, they're beginning to twinkle in the other. In the other, that's This right. is the way it all is. So therefore, now is the hour, as we read from Simeon. Now, Master, you can let your servant go in peace. All has happened just as you promised in Luke 2. And Jesus frequently uses this word, Matthew 5. How happy are you poor? Right now is the, the kingdom of God is yours. Or Luke 6, Alas for you who are rich and having your consolation now. Alas for you who have your fill now. Also if you can only laugh now, you will mourn and weep. So this now is today, this very moment. Now is the hour. Indeed I promise you, we read in Luke so often, he mentions this now and today. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born. Chapter 2. They were astounded and praised God and filled with awe at Jesus' teaching. They said, we heard, seen strange things today. I promise you, he replied, today you will be with me in paradise. So there are biblical themes and retreat themes about today. There was a very popular song in the 1950s, Now is the Hour. 
it's a kind of a sad one in the one way. Uh, now is the hour that I must say goodbye. <laughs> we say in our little antiphon for this course, this is the day the Lord That's has made. Right. Let us rejoice and be and be glad in it. Or that famous old rather corny joke, I guess, was a parish uh, party in which one lady always took care of the desserts. Well, eventually she up and dies. When they buried her, they buried her with the fork and the little sign, the best is yet to come. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what she always says, I think. And we're now in this now-not-yet situation. For example, no one arrested Jesus because his time had not yet come. Romans 8, we must content, be content to hope that we will be saved. Our salvation is not in sight. We, should, we would not have to be hoping if it were. But as I say, we must hope to be saved since we are not yet saved. It is something we must wait for. That's Romans 8, Philippians 3. Not that I have become perfect yet. I have not yet won, but I am still running now to capture the prize for which Christ captured me. I assure you, brothers, I am far from thinking that I have already won. Not that I have become perfect yet. All I can say is, I forget the past and straight forward to what is yet to come. I am racing from the finish line for the prize to which God calls me, upwards to receive in Christ Jesus. It's like Hebrews 6. You don't throw the anchor down. Throw it up into the cloud. Romans 6, uh, Hebrews 6, 18. Or First John chapter 3. My dear people, we are already the children of God, but what we are to be in the future has not yet been revealed. All we know is that when it is revealed, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Mm. And we saw this when we were pondering the icon of the transfiguration. We're gradually being transformed. And sometimes that's a fire of purification, personal suffering, the loss of people we love. What's it all about, Alfie, getting to be aimless or every once in a while really looking down on ourselves, which God does not want. Our old belief in it, in all of our repentance, if there's not hope in it, it really does not seem to be Christian at all. To seek sincerely, we will find. Here we are, to seek God in Jesus Christ. We seek the mercy of God in the crucifixion and in all the other paradoxes of the life of Christ. So we find the great summaries of the Acts of the Apostles in chapters 2 and 4. These are summaries what it meant to be a member of this new way it was, way it was called, to remain faithful to it. This is what we read. What is the church? It's those who remained faithful to the teaching of the Apostles to the brotherhood, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Uh-huh. These are the four pillars, we might say, of our quest for the Lord. Say those again. We, to be faithful to the teaching of the apostles, that's a magisterium, yeah. to the brotherhood, to the communion brother. of saints, to the breaking of the bread, and that's uh, Eucharist, to the prayers, yeah. liturgy of the hour, and our own personal prayers. This is the sustanza. This is the substance. So to remain faithful means a kind of persistent application concentrated on a subject. So being born in a country that was established by the Declaration of Independence, Mm -hmm. it's very hard to be obedient ecclesially. And I've often thought in the priestly life, we, uh, like everybody, have to keep the Ten Commandments. We have to keep our vows. We have to keep dogmatically in in harmony with the church, liturgically in harmony with the requirements of the church, fidelity in the liturgy of the hours, and then the way we offer Mass. The Eucharist is not ours. We are offering this for other people, for the parish, or that famous procession through the church on Sunday morning. We're not saying, hey, look at me. We're saying, hey, I came from you. And that's where I'm headed. Mm -hmm. I have come here for you. I have come here this day to offer this Eucharist for you. So in a way, we might end here with Kierkegaard's idea of contemporaneity. To seek Jesus 
means to struggle to understand one's own presence, present. What is happening? What's happened in the church? The ominous signs of the evening news or the daily newspaper. We might sit there with a little, little spark caught in a whirlwind being thrown hither and yon. Well, the signs of the times would remind us, I will be with you all times, even to the consummation of this world. Do not be afraid, I will be with you. In a certain sense, to give in to fear is to cop out. Mm-hmm. It's like not going out on Halloween night. <laughs> we have to go out to greet the uh, new, the, the coming of all the saints on the next day. The economy of salvation is a plan, a design, a project. In the pessimistic world, there are many ways of looking at life. One is the plague, that famous uh, novel, which was a star. The whole world has a bubonic plague. Right. Or that other one, there's a captain on the, uh, on the ship, and we're all with the crew. We fell overboard, and we're swimming like mad. And he laughs, he says, you're going for a shore that doesn't exist. That is simply not the Christian idea. Mm-hmm. The problem is, like in the Old Testament, people would not understand Proverbs. Well, we have an enormous difficulty in understanding paradoxes. How could the God of love allow what's happened? Right. Well, <clears throat> St. Thomas, naive though he may be considered to be, but to me it's that on. This is the best way in which the Lord's ultimate decrees uh, uh, can be fulfilled. I remember having a classmate way, way back in high school, and he became sadly an alcoholic. And he lived a very, very roundabout life and rustic, rough and tumble, and God was a distant. But somehow he bumped into a priest who was able to talk some sense in him, and he became one of the nicest young men, and everybody liked him. Mm-hmm. One night he got killed. Mm-hmm. And the priest said that he thought that God took him at the best time. Mm-hmm. And and maybe, you know, sometimes we try to fathom these things and what is it all about, Alfie? Why do bad things happen to good people? We don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know. But the cross of Christ was not the end of Christianity. The burial in the tomb did not end the Eucharist. It's still there waiting for us each and every day. And this enormous treasury of God's word is there for the asking. The Roman soldier has already opened this treasury of divine wisdom by his lance. Blood and water have poured forth, and for us that's baptism and the Eucharist leading us to listen to the word of God. And if we listen enough, you know what might happen? We might find a lot of Jews listening Many, many brothers, maybe more Protestants than us, and who knows, it might be a way of bringing us all together in this home stretch. It's a fanciful idea, but I really believe it. Mm. I think union will come through prayer. I think there's too many good people out there for God just to blow up the whole world. Most people seem to be very good, quite good. And the transfiguration is our little spark in the night that helps us to grow upon searching for the light of the resurrection. And this is when I now hear the old song, What's It All About, Alfie? I say, well, the transfiguration is is lighting one candle in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. So there is a plan. There's a plan for me. There's a plan for you. Nothing happens. A, a, A sparrow does not fall out of the sky without the Lord knowing it. Do you ever read where the Lord says, Did you not know that the Son of Man had to endure these things and so come into his story? Well, I do not believe that you and I have to go through whatever we've gone through in the great hopes that we might have everlasting life. So it is necessary that some of these things happen. And so much has happened we wish didn't. But it did. So therefore, we with the apostles, Lord, we're trying to pray, but you've got to help us. Lord, we believe, but some, sometimes the articles of faith seem like soap in the bathtub. They slip away when we try to get all of them. 
but to go on in the quest to seek to seek the Lord and his word. A great summary of what church people what church people are meant to be is facts is Acts nine two, thirteen, eighteen, nineteen and twenty two. We are followers of the way. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles call belonging to the church as joining the way. The way is that way of life characteristic of the Christian community for us who believe. The term is used by extension to the community of itself. When human beings follow the way, God is really served as he wants to be served. This unqualified use of the word is particular to Acts 18, 19, and so on. The idea is a response, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In Christ, the transfigured Christ, we have access to the Father, to the Son in the brilliance of his resurrection, who makes the Father known to us all. He is eternal life in and through the Holy Spirit. So, is it mumbo-jumbo? Well, it's not easy to understand. Uh, There's a great holocaust of intellect and will. Intellect understand all these things and will to do them for a lifetime. So, it's hard, but it's possible. This future, good. This difficult, but possible. So, we commit our lives in every offertory procession. And if we could remember the great story of Mary, our mother of mercy, when the angel of the Lord spoke to her, she said, let it be done. And then she says that to us in John 2. You do whatever he tells you to do. None of us knows the future, but a light in the night is certainly a a sign of consolation of which way to go. And we think the way to go is to follow Christ through his Gethsemane to the transfiguration of his resurrection. And so I, we come now down to the last very few minutes of this beautiful series of reflections. And it's uh, wonderful to end the way you began because I think, as I think about what your message means to me, is that life is a long voyage out mm. into the deep, a deep mm. we don't understand, mm. toward a shore we can't see, mm. but we know is there. Mm. And that our our job in life is mm. to stay faithful, mm. to stay hopeful, to keep going in mm. perseverance, mm. to trust and be ready for where God sends mm. us and without ever turning passive or mm-hmm. slack, mm-hmm. and but to not get ahead of him, to just mm-hmm. keep going yes. in this procession that is um, the glorious procession of us all to and our... Old, old Peter telling us to go out into the deep brings me back to the image of standing on the back of that old Italian liner in October of 19, 1952, as the lights of the United States became dimmer and dimmer brand new world opened up on the other side. (laughs) In Naples the day after Columbus Day. We thought we had it all backwards. Columbus found us on the 12th and we landed in Genoa on the 12th (laughs) of 1952. Well, it brings me back to Peter's great dream. Simon and his companions set out to search for him. Mark 1. Jesus said, You will look for me. Where I am going, you cannot come. But Peter said, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. You will follow you later. But Simon, our great ally, says, why can we not follow you now? And First Peter 5, bow down before the power of God now. And he will raise you up on an appointed day. Unload all your worries on him because he is seeking you. That's beautiful. Well, Father, it's, um, I think, nothing I can say. It just is something so so very powerful mm. to absorb. Mm. And all of us who've listened to you these many hours, thank you for all, using your bits of precious energy mm. to try to communicate all of this and mm. give us hope for our own futures. Thank well, you so, for listening. Well, thank you for teaching, and, and we'll conclude with one final prayer. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, St. Peter, please pray for us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Father, for teaching. And thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.